Lovely. Okay, thanks for bearing with everyone. Um, I'm Eve. I'm just finished FY1 at uh, Salford Royal in Manchester. Thought I'd just share a few things that I've learned along the way. Um, this is meant to be sort of an interactive talk, so I've tried to make a couple of cases and things. Um, so feel free either with like a pen and paper or in the chat um, to follow along and to try and hazard a guess with what you would do in the different scenarios. Um, so we'll start off with a few disclaimers. Um, obviously, this doesn't supersede any teaching or training you get at hospitals and guidelines are different depending on where you work. Um, so obviously, just um, defer to them if there's any discrepancies. Um, I think this is a big thing that um, no one really told me at the start of F1, that it's not on you alone to, to like to save anyone's life or to do anything life changing. Obviously, yes, you'll see unwell patients, but your main job is to detect who's well and who's unwell and then escalate that appropriately and if someone is really unwell um it's never just going to be you in that situation it'll be you plus um a whole team um so obviously we talk through some quite unwell patients in this but um in real life you're not going to be on your own um again the cases we'll discuss this is probably a collection of all the horrendous things myself and my colleagues have seen this year most of the bleeps that you'll get um on a night shift or an on-call shift will be like prescribed paracetamol or you know someone's a bit agitated on the ward and you go and calm them down and you know they have a cup of tea and they're fine um so this talk isn't meant to scare you at all um, and even if you do have a horrendous shift, which I've done, everyone's done, um, they end. And as long as you just do what you can for as long as you're working for, um, then just hand over and switch off after your shift, then that's all anyone can ask of you. Um, and again, we won't cover the sort of whole management of all these conditions, just the sort of FY1 bits that you need to know. Um, and you always have more time than you think. So if you um, are seeing an unwell patient and you really don't know what to do, you always have a couple of minutes to grab a computer, look up a guideline or a protocol or bleep someone for um, help or advice. Um, I've done that in, in loads of scenarios. So it's definitely safer if you feel you need it just to take a step back and, and take a deep breath. All right, so we'll start with the first um, bleep then. Um, someone bleeps you saying, hi, doctor. Um, Miss Smith has a BP of 82 over 50. Can you come and review them? Um, so what kind of things do you want to know about this patient or with regards to the bleep? Um, so I don't know if I'm able to actually see the chat while I'm still in this. Are you guys still able to see the slide if I click into the medal tab? Yeah, we can still see your tab. Yeah. Lovely. OK, yeah. So just fire into the chat. What are the things you'd want to ask um, this nurse who's on the other end of the phone? Rest of the up. Absolutely. Where's the patient? Definitely, yeah. So we're sort of information gathering here about why they've come in, what they're on. Hospital number, yes, you can look them up. Brilliant. What kind of age they are. Um, so the way that I information gather, and it's something I've only picked up recently, is to information gather in order of acuity. Um, so if any alarm bells ring with the early stuff, then you obviously know to hang up and go to the patient immediately. So first off, I start with, are they conscious? Are they breathing? Are you concerned about them? Um, the second question is is a much more subjective question. But if um, an, a nurse says that they're really worried about a patient, I'm then automatically really worried about that patient. Um, they just sort of have that sense of when someone's about to go off. Um, so that's one of the things that I'll take most seriously. Um, after that, if they are conscious and if the nurse is maybe a little bit worried about them, but not so, so worried that you need to go and see them right now, you can um, do some uh, other information gathering. So do they have any other symptoms or signs, um, any chest pain, shortness of breath, are they bleeding? Do they look particularly unwell? Um, and then loads of people have mentioned the other OBS as well, which is great because you have to take all these things in, in the context um, that they're given, don't you? Um, so their heart rate, um, oxygen sats, near increasing oxygen requirement and temp um, as well. Um, and then if all of the above are okay, maybe look into like when and why they're admitted, past medical history, medications, um, and all that good stuff that you guys are mentioning in the chat. Um, so this is what she says to you. Um, she is conscious, but she's a little bit drowsy. Um, at this point, sort of slightly worried, but maybe don't know enough um, to sort of fully assess the situation. Um, we then ask about symptoms, what else has been going on? Um, and at that point, she says that she's just vomited up about half a pint of blood. 
Um, at this point, it's probably time to just go to the patient because any other information that you get isn't really going to change your initial management. Um, so probably um, best to do a speedy walk slash run to the ward. Um, so oftentimes, um, especially if, um, which I highly recommend all you guys get, is the induction app on your mobile. Sometimes I'll take these bleeps while I'm on my way to the ward, um, which is really useful because you can ask people to do initial investigations and things that you're going to need. Um, so is there anything that you would like um, the nursing staff to do for this patient while you're walking to the ward? Repeat the obs, yep, make sure it's a true BP. IV access, group and save, lovely. So we all kind of have a, a sense of what might be going on here. Um, so can they take bloods? Yeah, so some some can and some can't. Um, and then obviously if, if one of your nurses can cannulate, that's really useful. Um, sometimes they'll ask what kind of IV access they have as well. If they've got a blue in their foot, probably not enough, is it? Um, so what I've put here um, have been sort of keep the BP puff, cuff and sets um, probe on just so you can repeat those obs um, and reassess while you're managing her. Um, obviously, if you're suspecting an upper GI bleed with a BP of 82, I would maybe ask them to put out either a met call or call an SH or a reg um, or a crash, troll, um, crash call. Um, for unwell patients, I tend to get the crash trolley and either have it just outside the room or attach the pads for monitoring as well. Um, but upper GI bleeds can deteriorate very, very rapidly. Um, so it's probably one that I want seniors to be aware of early, especially when you're early on um, in your FI1 year. Um, make sure you've got access, which a lot of you said, which was fabulous. Um, either try start to try taking bloods um, or prep a tray if there's no one who can take bloods. Um, if they do have access, it might be an idea to run through IV fluids. Um, I don't like throwing fluids at every hypotensive patient I'm bleeped to see, but this um, patient clearly has pathology, don't they? Um, so, uh, and then get a computer on wheels just to see what they've been admitted with, um, especially sort of alcohol history and things would be really useful to know. Um, so obviously there are loads of like algorithms for how you treat um, an upper GI bleed, um, but your job really is to keep them stable while your senior and just definitive management, because um, ultimately they will need scoped. Um, so part of that is just keeping them stable while they're being prepped to go for scope and gather the information that the endoscopist is going to want to know. So I've broken it up into two um, steps. So with stabilization, you just fall back on your A to E. Um, and then for information gathering, you're going to need everything that's in the Glasgow Blatchford score. And then you're also going to need to establish whether the bleed is varicel or ulcer related, um, because that affects how you manage them and what medications you give them. Um, I just thought I'd talk quickly through the Glasgow Blatchford score in case anyone's not seen it. Um, so it sort of stratifies how um, quickly they need scoped um, and if you're working in a &E, whether or not they can be discharged with an outpatient scope or whether they need to be admitted. A lot of this you'll get in your ATE anyway, but it's always useful to bear in mind while you're assessing and stabilizing the patient. Um, so uh, yeah, as I said, for ATE, we'll talk through each of the bits um, individually. And again, for an upper GI bleed, I probably let a senior know before fully completing my ATE. Um, so for A, her airway's patent, it's her own, so she's not intubated or anything. Um, she has vomited, obviously half a pint of blood, but there's no gurgling or snoring. And her GCS is about 13 at the moment. She's a little bit drowsy. Um, GCS 13 wouldn't be considered to be airway threatening. So it's not like GC, um, GCS 8 intubate. Um, is there anything you would do for A at this point? Um, and while you're having a think, I'll just answer a couple of the questions. Um, so Reem, yeah, I've had colleagues, um, obviously like fast bleed bridges and things for GI bleeds before they have all the information, um, especially sort of early on in the FY1. Um, if that seems a bit like intimidating or you go to them and they've vomited up blood and they look quite well, I would at the very least let an SHO know. Um, and then how would you determine whether they're also a virus seal bleed? A lot of it is based off risk factors. So if they've had loads of um, NSAIDs and stuff in the past, then it's more likely to be ulcer related. If there's an alcohol history, it's more likely to be virus seal. Um, that matters because virus seal bleeds um, carry an increased risk of, um, still think about risk of aspiration. Yep, suction, yeah, great. So um, that's essentially what I've put as well. Um, ensure substance at the bedside in case they vomit again um, and they're already drowsy. So ensure you've got your airway adjuncts in case they become unable to protect their own airway. Um, so an NP and an OP. 
Great. Um, so you're you're happy with A and then you move on to B. So she is quite technique. Um, her rate is about 25 and her SATS probe isn't picking up a trace at the moment. Is there anything else that you guys would like to do? ABG, yeah, if they're hypoxic. Move the SATS probe, yeah. Um, this is a big one. I've had to call um, the ICU reg a couple of times for desaturations. And like the first thing they do when they get to a patient, even if they look really unwell, is like try the SATS probe on each finger, try an ear probe. And yeah, absolutely give oxygen because this lady's quite unwell, isn't she? Um, so high flow um, oxygen, 15 litres, normally breathe. That's for any unwell patient. Um, and make sure that um, you give yourself the best chance of picking up um, an oxygen saturation as you can. See so then, so her BP is now 79 over 50. Heart rate's about 130, and she does look quite pale um, and quite unwell. Um, anything you guys would do? A lot of you suggested it earlier, um, so we'll start to talk through that. Um, people obviously mentioned IV access, they mentioned some fluids, they mentioned taking some bloods, um, and I can see a VBG um, in the comments as well, which would be really useful for a lactate. Um, HB might be normal on a VBG initially, especially in an acute bleed, but still definitely useful. Fluid resus, yeah. Um, lovely. So um, obviously two wide bore access, ideally. Um, if you're really struggling, um, then a pink is better than nothing. Initially, like when I saw unwell patients, I would like go and grab green cannula and then I'd probably waste like 10 to 15 minutes trying to get like two green cannulas in. Um, if you're in like a bit of a pickle, you can give fluid resus through a pink cannula. So like don't stress. Um, these patients aren't going to be particularly well filled and they're not going to be the easiest stick. Um, when you're cannulating them, they obviously need a load of bloods, um, full blood count, obviously, um, LFTs, INR, VBG and E's and E's, um, group and save and cross match as well. So any upper GI bleed um, would be a major hemorrhage protocol if it's like a true bleed. Um, in different hospitals, um, what you get with major hemorrhage protocol can vary. Um, sometimes people will come with loads of Oneg. Um, sometimes, like in my hospital, they don't. Um, but it just sort of alerts the blood bank that you might need a lot of blood fast. Um, while you wait for the blood when you're giving fluid resus, crystalloids are better than saline. Um, I like Hartman's as a fluid resus um, anyway. Um, but yeah, it just um, has carries out of risk of sort of hyperchloremic acidosis. If they're on anticoagulants, um, which you can check with the computer on wheels that you've asked to bring the bedside earlier, um, then they might need those reversed and they might need any coagulopathy reversed as well. Um, so like vitamin K, FFP, if they're on any DOACs, they might need specific reversal agents, um, etc. Um, yeah, and so Morella, uh, you mentioned transfusing blood based on the HB. Um, she's got a clinical bleed, so I'd probably transfuse her anyway, or at least um, put all the all the precautions in place. Um, right, so for D, her GCS remains 15, which, um, 13, sorry, which is good. Um, she's maintaining her own airway at that GCS, uh, and her BM on the VBG is about 5. Um, so you probably don't need much intervention there. The main um, pathology is obviously in C, isn't it? So for this, I've just put monitor GCS in case her airway becomes at risk. Um, so you move on to E. Um, abdomen soft. She does have a little bit of um, epigastric tenderness, um, but she's a febrile at the moment. Not much you can probably do at the bedside as an FY1. Um, I mean, they just need scope, don't they? Um, this is why you need to establish if it's varicele versus ulcer related. Um, if it's varicele, they'll require antibiotics because there's an increased chance of um, bacteria sort of seeding um, from the esophagus. They'll need metoclopramide to reduce blood flow to the varices. Um, and then they'll also need terlipressin to help stabilise them as well. Um, so you've done your stabilisation um, while the reg is on the phone and you gathered your information, um, which is good. Um, so that's about it. I mean, that's obviously all you'll need to know as an FY1 um, for an upper GI bleed. Uh, what level of permissive hypertension would you say is patient can tolerate? Um, so 
I mean, for upper GI bleeds, permissive hypotension isn't really a thing. I've seen ones where patients are transfused like up to 19 units. Um, obviously, the main thing is keeping their perfusion at an adequate level until you can definitively manage them. And endoscopy isn't the easiest thing to coordinate, so you don't necessarily know how long it'll be. Um, do they need PPI protection? Kind of depends on the trust guidelines. Um, I don't think we give PPI protection. I base this off of the Northern Care Alliance um, guideline, which doesn't um, recommend PPIs. Um, and Chrysilla, what's a met call? Some hospitals have um, scenarios where if someone's using above a certain level or if you're nervous about them, you can have a met call team come out and it's normally um, like ex-ICU advanced practitioners and F1 and F2 um, plus minus a regen anaesthetics if you need them. So it's like below a crash call. Um, some hospitals have them, some don't. Um, it's quite useful. All right, so uh, that's upper GI bleeds, really. Um, if anyone has any more questions, fire them into the chat, um, but we'll just move on to the next bleep. Um, so this second bleep then, um, you just get Dr. Bed 7 as a BP of 90 over 63. Um, can you please review? So again, what kind of things do you want to know? Um, and we'll just go through the same structure for all of these bleeps because I sort of use the same um, the same tack whenever I'm answering any of these bleeps. Ob symptoms, yeah, lovely. Um, yeah, grand. So ask an order of acuity. One, are they conscious breathing? Are you concerned about them? Number two, what are the other symptoms and signs? And then three, what are the other OBS? And then if all of that is pretty reassuring, then you can go into why they were admitted um, and their background. Um, so for this person then, um, she's awake, just woken up on my morning OBS round. So it's about six o'clock in the morning at this point. Um, she says she feels okay. Nothing much there, not reporting any symptoms. Um, heart rate's 85. She's saturating 100% on room air and her temperature is 37. And all of that sounds pretty reassuring to you. So you go in to ask about her background and why she was admitted and things. So um, this is a 30 year old lady and um, she's got long term nephrostomies and she had a bit of bleeding after they were routinely changed. She's been admitted. Um, that's about it. And then um, someone mentioned other OBS as well, as in previous OBS. Um, so this is a sort of OBS chart. I'll give you guys a few minutes to sort of read over it um, and just sort of note it. Okay, so um, assessment wise then, um, you go and see her, mucous membranes are pretty moist. Um, she's had no recent diary and vomiting. She's producing good amounts of dilute urine. Um, she's been having one to two jugs of squash per day since being in the hospital. Um, do you guys think any actions required? How worried are you about this patient? Yeah, does she have symptoms otherwise monitor? Not urgent, yeah, exactly. Um, and this is most of the low BP bleeps you'll get will be like this, um, probably no action required. You can encourage PO fluids. Um, if a BP is a little bit low, you can do a lying standing BP. Um, obviously it's six o'clock in the morning, so maybe wait until she's had a cup of coffee and, and um, repleted her fluids and her, her in, um, oral intake. Um, so, for these patients where they've got a low BP, but they kind of seem okay and they're asymptomatic, I really struggled with like a systematic way to assess them. Um, so if you're called for a low BP and there's not an obvious emergency or a cause, this is the sort of structure I follow. Um, so the general history, I break it into fluid in and fluid out. So with fluid in, how much have they been having? Um, sort of ask the nurses like how many jugs of water they've had, how many coffees. Have they been ill by mouth for a surgery and they're only recently just allowed to eat and drink? Um, and then for fluid out, I mainly ask about like diarrhea, vomiting. Have they been urinating a lot? If so, does it look pretty concentrated? Um, or is it sort of good amounts of dilute urine that they're producing? 
Um, have they been sort of sweating particularly if they're febrile? Um, if you're in one of those rogue hospitals with like a burns unit, maybe have a look at insensible losses, things like that. Um, then I just do a general fluid balance assessment and see how well filled they are. Um, mucous membranes, JVP, look at their peripheral pulses and their cap refill time. And if all of that's okay, that's probably as far as I would take it at three in the morning if all of their obs are all right as well. Um, if you sort of have someone that's a little bit borderline low um, and you don't know whether or not to be worried about them, the mean arterial pressure is a really good and probably more useful marker of perfusion than BP alone. Um, so MD Calc has like a little calculator where you put in the systolic and the diastolic and it gives you the MAP. Over 60 is generally considered to be um, uh, compatible with, with adequate perfusion um, and it's over 75 in someone with known hypertension. Um, and then lying standing BP is useful to see if they've got an orthostat um, orthostatic drop and um, they might need sort of more um, like more encouragement um, for intake of oral fluids. Um, not everyone needs intervention and most of the low BP bleeps don't. Um, that's absolutely fine as long as you document why you're not worried um, and as long as you recognise the patients that are sick. Um, so Daniel, can this be dealt with over the phone? Should you go and review them? Um, I mean, again, it sort of depends on what you're comfortable with and your sort of um, threshold. Um, if you're in a really busy hospital and you have loads of bleeps with patients who may or may not be more unwell, then I think that would be reasonable. Um, at the start, I used to just go and sort of review everyone because I was very aware that I didn't know enough um, to be confident in whether or not I was worried about a patient. Um, but yeah, certainly if, if you're not concerned and you're really, really swamped, then it might be worth just popping a note on and asking them to do an LSBP, um, asking them to start a fluid chart and to bleep you if, if they're particularly worried about anything else. Um, okay, any questions about that one? I'm more than happy to go back, so just keep firing them into the chat. Um, so Dr. Addy's asked um, a very clever question about um, pantoprazole being the safest PPI for a patient who's also on clopidogrel. Um, I'm going to um, pass on that one. I've got no idea. Um, I have um, my first job was on a cardio ward. I saw a lot of patients who were on clopidogrel who were also on a meprazole. I don't know if that was particularly evidence based choice, um, but just from the volume of patients I've seen, I, I wouldn't say that it would be unsafe. I don't know why we weren't prescribing pantoprazole um, over that. I'm unsure. Um, I would probably just go by by your local trust guideline on that. Um, if there's an issue with fluid intake or outtake on an exam, what would you do? Um, so again, I just um, assess that individual issue. Oh, not at all. Um, oh, Shadi, sorry that I don't have the answer. Um, if there's an issue with fluid intake or outtake, yeah, I would just address that individual issue. So if a patient is vomiting, obviously establish if there's an infective cause, maybe um, they might be on a lot of opioids and quite opioid sensitive. Is it something that you can manage with antiemetics or is it something that you're a bit more concerned about as a potential pathology? Um, it's the same thing if they've got diarrhea, have they just been put on antibiotics or um, could it possibly be infective? Do you need to consider isolating them and doing a steel culture and all that kind of stuff? Um, if they're urinating frequently, but only tiny little concentrated amounts, do they have a UTI? Um, or, you know, is it someone who's just recently had a trial without catheter and they're not passing much? If it's someone who's passing loads and loads of urine and really thirsty, do you need to start thinking about um, endocrine causes? So, again, it's sort of pretty symptom specific. Um, but just to address those individually, um, if someone is on, like, say, for example, if they've been prescribed antibiotics and they then have diarrhea, maybe look and see if per their sensitivities, you could change them to something that's a bit more GI sensitive Um or if you could sort of replenish them with fluids while they're having their antibiotics and while those antibiotics can be reviewed by a senior in the morning. All right. Um, fluids and heart failure. I thought I'd just put a slide on this as well, because this is something, again, that really scared me. There's a common theme. A lot of things really scared me this time last year, um, especially if someone's got known heart failure. Um, obviously, more caution is required if they're at an increased risk of circulatory overload. Um, so heart failure, low BMI, you know, those wee 45 kilo um ladies on the Jerry's wards and things or patients on diuretics who obviously are overloaded anyway. Um, so obviously be careful um, in documenting your justification for any IV fluid in these patients. If they need it and they're unwell then that's that's pretty reasonable. Um, if you're unsure how they would respond a straight leg raise and then repeating the BP is really useful. Um, when you raise the patient's um, legs 
all of the volume that was in their legs go sort of back into the right ventricle and it increases the preload the same way that a bolus of IV fluid was. So it kind of simulates a fluid bolus without you actually having given the fluid. If their BP improves with that, then it's a sign that they are more fluid responsive. If the BP doesn't improve, then the fluid's more likely to end up in a third space and you're more likely to overload them. Um, so that's just a useful thing that I picked up. If you do give them fluid, obviously start small, start slow and frequently reassess them and safety net in the notes as well. I always document and let the nurses know to rebeat me if they become short of breath or the SATs drop or anything um, so that I can then investigate them for edema. Um, all right. Um, yeah, lovely. So um, third bleep then. Um, hi, my patient, Mr. Neil, is having some chest pain. Can you come and review him, please? Again, um, you guys know the drill. So we're going to ask about, obviously, um, if they're conscious, if you're worried about them, other symptoms, um, shortness of breath, bleeding, sweatiness, um, and then their other orbs as well. So are they HD stable with chest pain or uh, not so much? And then obviously, if they seem okay from all of that, maybe look into when and why they're admitted quite quickly. Um, but with a chest pain, I would probably um, go to them quicker than for other bleeps. Um, so I thought we'd just do a bit of like a quick fire diagnosis round. So essentially, on one side, you're going to see like some investigations, history, exams. And then if you fire in what you think it's most likely to be, and then we can talk through sort of the FY bits of management. Um, so Marilla, would you ask about when the pain started, type of pain, et cetera, over the phone? Um, I mean, the, it, I find it more useful to get a good history myself. Um, obviously, what they tell the nurses will be useful and it'll be useful to compare that to what they tell you because patients might remember different things at the time they're having chest pain. They might be able to give a more accurate history at that time or actually they might be in too much pain to give a good history to whoever's seeing them first. And then by the time you see them, they might be a bit more compass mentis and a bit more able to articulate what's wrong with them. So I would always just get there and assess them in person. Um, so this person then has non-radiating central chest pain, sweaty, nauseated, started about an hour ago and they've taken the GTN brain has not helped. Those are their observations, um, bloods and their ECG. So what do you think is going on with this patient or what are you worried about? And I've accidentally left a little spoiler in the reference for the ECG. Sorry, guys. Yeah, absolutely. There's T-wave inversion in the lateral leads there, isn't there? Um, 1B5, B6. Yeah, so you would be concerned about an NSTEMI, wouldn't you? Especially with that trope, that's pretty, pretty worrying. Um, so yeah, you're concerned about an ACS. Um, so then this is just the general um, stuff that I would sort of do for an ACS. Um, I'll, I'll load them with analgesia first. Um, I do that for a number of reasons. The first thing is that it'll reduce myocardial demand and it reduces the ischemic damage. It also makes patients more calm and articulate and more able to tell you what's going on and more compliant with treatment. Um, so patients, obviously, if you give them a bit of IV morphine first, they'll be able to properly take in those GTN sprays and you'll be able to assess the effect of those more accurately than if they're too busy focusing on the pain, focus on anything else. Um, so try a couple of sprays of GTN. If it doesn't work, then they might need an infusion. Um, and obviously be aware that GTN can cause hypotension. Um, so if it's a STEMI or an NSTEMI and they're unstable, ongoing pain, or there's really dynamic ECG changes and they're gonna need PCI, um, it's usually a senior who discusses with the PCI center. And just like with the upper GI blade, it's you that in, is information gathering and facilitating that discussion, um, like getting the patient's notes up beside, you know, the reg or whoever's dealing with it. Um, ensure they're on rhythm monitoring if they're having an ACS, because obviously they can deteriorate into ventricular arrhythmias. Um, I would maybe put the pads on a patient who's having an ACS, put it on the defib set and the monitoring setting and have them move to a cardiac monitored bed or at least somewhere where they are able to be monitored um, more closely than on a general ward. Um, again, I would speak to a senior before loading them with DAPT um, or I always have. Um, just because they are best placed to um, establish whether or not there's a significant enough of bleeding risk that you would um, hold fire. Um, if they do need loaded with DAPT and they ask you to prescribe it, then it's 300 milligrams of aspirin plus um, loading with either Cloppy, Ticagrelor or Prasigrel. 
Cloppy is less sort of bleedy, so they use it in patients with high risks of bleeding. Um, otherwise, they use ticagrelor. Um, giving a beta blocker and an ACE inhibitor um, at the time that they're having the ACS, um, as soon as they're stable enough to have that sort of antihypertensive effect, improves the mortality as well. Um, and unlike with other OML patients, you only give oxygen if they're um, hypo, um, hypoxic, because over oxygenating them worsens mortality in ACS. Um, so. Um, Morella, would you give dual antiplatelets yourself or wait till senior help arrives? Um, if it's an ACS, I I would get senior help, to be honest. Um, I'd either, I mean, in the cases that I've seen in ACS, I've either asked the SHO, um, I've either asked the nurses to bleed the SHO, or if they look really unwell, really diaphoretic, red in the face, and I'm really concerned that they're going to deteriorate, um, I would put out a MET call. Um, so DAP stands for dual antiplatelet therapy. All right, so that's um, ACS in a nutshell. Um, this is the next case then. So they've got right chest pain. Um, it's worse when they're coughing. Um, they're short of breath as well. They're day two post-op. Um, they're saturated 92% on room air. Rest rate's about 27. Um, and these are their um, investigations. And again, really sorry, I've left a little spoiler. There was no way to reference this without, yeah, without spoiling the diagnosis. Try not to look at it if you can. Lovely. Very sharp group today. Excellent. Yeah. So you'd be worried about a PE, wouldn't you? Um, so just going through it, obviously any hypoxic patient with a completely normal um, chest x-ray should raise suspicion for a PE. Um, sinus tachycardia is the most common ECG finding. You can, I've seen one patient, I think, with S1, Q3, T3, um, but it's not that common at all. And obviously if they're post-op and they're desaturating, um, you obviously need to worry about um, venous thromboembolism. Um, so for PE, you give high flow O2. Um, if they're stable, then they have um, a CT pulmonary angio. Um, if they're too unstable, they can have a bedside echo. And if the right um, ventricle is dysfunctional, then they can be treated just on the basis of that. I've never seen that before, but um, BMJ best practice says that's an option if you can't get someone down to the scanner. Um, for anticoagulation, again, I always just either run it by a senior um, or wait until the senior assesses them themselves, especially in surgical blocks. So um, for post-op patients, obviously, um, it's high risk to put someone on therapeutic anticoagulation. Um, seniors have handled it in different ways, depending on who's been on. So some um, seniors have wanted to not start anticoagulation until they have that CTP report in their hand that says that they've got a PE. Um, even then, they might want their um, dose of tinsaparin or whatever to be um, split. So they have like, say, 6,500 BD instead of 13,000 units just once a day. Um, for PE, um, this is one where IV fluids um, are only useful for hypotensive, and this is why I don't throw um, IV fluids at every patient um, that I see who is hypotensive. Um, fluids obviously increase that um, load on the right ventricle, and they can increase mortality from PE. Um, lovely, thanks, James. Yeah, so a met call is a medical emergencies team. Um, so again, it can depend on um, how that's structured in the hospital. Sometimes you get like resus A and P's and F1 and F2. Sometimes you get a reg. Um, it's sort of like a similar team to you would get if you call the crash call out, but with, with slightly less acuity and they're able to sort of split themselves between more bleeps and things. So um, it's just below a crash call. Lovely. So again, that's P in a nutshell. Any questions, feel free to find them in the chat as always. Um, okay, so this third patient then, 65-year-old male, he's on the ward for a hip replacement um, tomorrow, so he's not had anything done to him yet. He's got palpitations and chest pain. His heart rate was 180. It looks like it's now about 150 at the time they did that ECG. BP is okay at about 135 over 86. Um, so what are you guys thinking? Um, so Eleanor's asked a question about um, whether or not you'd have a senior review before ordering a CTPA. Um, if I have clinical suspicion of a, C of a PE, I'd obviously just want to let a senior know about them. Um, just be like, there's this patient on 
more B, whatever. Um, I think they're having a PE. I've already ordered the CTPA and had it vetted. In some hospitals, you can't order CTs. Um, so my partner is an FI1 at Warrington, and I think he can't order CTs. So he obviously would have to discuss it with a senior anyway, and the senior would then have to order the scan. So it just depends. Um, yeah, so I think two people have gone for SVT. One person's gone for Wolf Parkinson White. Um, I Yeah, I can kind of see where you're going with that. Um, I'll chat through why it's not Wolf Parkinson White. Um, so the PR interval there looks okay. I see what you kind of mean about maybe a delta wave, but it's not very pronounced. Um, when people with Wolf Parkinson White get this tacky, uh, you would expect the morphology to look a little bit different. Um, it wouldn't be as narrow complex. So with any tacky, obviously divided into whether or not it's regular or irregular, this looks nice and regular. And then if it's broader, narrow complex, and this looks nice and narrow. So yeah, I would go with SVT. So um, this is what they teach you about SVT, and this is what you have to know um, for your finals. So um, obviously, if they're stable, um, then you can start vagal maneuvers, um, the modified valsalva, which is where you get them to blow into a little syringe and then like hike their legs up, um, or carotid um, sinus massage as well. If that doesn't work, then you can move on to a bit of adenosine, provided that's not contraindicated. Um, asthma is the main one I can think of. And then if that's unsuccessful, you can move on to um, a calcium channel blocker or a beta blocker. Um, if they're unstable, then you would just um, switch straight to DC cardioversion. So pop the pads on, initial sort of low dual shock, and then you repeat the shocks in stepwise increases. Um, for the F1 bit, again, for an SVT, I would probably call for help. If it's an SVT and they're unstable, that's probably a crash call. Because um, again, they're at risk of deteriorating into ventricular arrhythmias. Um, so this is kind of what I have done when I've been asked to see people um, on the boards and when colleagues have asked, been asked to see people who've turned out to be SVTs. So get someone to get the crash trolley and put the pads on to monitor the rhythm in case they deteriorate or arrest. Um, if they're conscious, you could sort of prep the equipment and talk the patient through the modified Valsalva. Um, I would be very hesitant to do the Valsalva without someone else there because it can precipitate other arrhythmias. Um, Make sure the patient has IV access in case that doesn't work and you need to go to a adenosine or a calcium channel blocker or a beta blocker. Um, get a complete computer on wheels um, so you can get some background as well um, so you can see whether they've got any contraindications to any of those treatments. So um, I've put there if someone's had a stroke then you um, cod carotid sinus massage is contraindicated. If they've got airways disease like asthma or COPD then adenosine is contraindicated if they've got active wheeze. Um, if there's enough staff to spare, you could ask someone to prep some adenosine or a calcium channel blocker or a beta blocker. Um, so that's it, really. Um, yeah, so that's SVT. Um, any questions about any of the three that we've gone through? Let's see, in terms of senior discussion, would it be your SHO or straight to the reg? Um, it kind of depends. Um, I'll mainly go through the SHO. Um, and the SHO can contact the reg if they feel it's necessary. If it's someone who I think is going to deteriorate in the time it takes me to contact the SHO and for the SHO to contact the reg, I might call the reg directly. Um, but yeah, it's more than reasonable to call your SHO if you just sort of get help early and escalate early. Um, I used to be sort of uh, quite nervous about escalating, but actually it's better that you escalate patients that don't need escalated than not escalating patients that do need escalated. Um, so, oh, Dr. Adi, I do know this. Um, so looking at ECG, how can you differentiate potentially peri arrest broad complex VT from um, SVT with the variant conductions? So um, in terms of whether or not, so with broad complex tachys, VT isn't the only broad complex tachy. However, it's the most common and it's the most dangerous. So when you see a broad complex tachy, it's always safer to assume that it is VT. Um, it's always important to get an, a 12 lead ECG because you can, um, after the fact, after they've been stabilized, you can determine it. A lot of it is based on sort of the amplitude. So in VT, um, there'll be the same um, axis in, across all the leads. They'll all deflect positively or negatively. In VT, the um, the broad, the width of the complexes will be the same. So it'll be equally broad, whereas in other rhythms, um, the breadth will vary. Um, other things like the history, so if someone's got a particular ischemic history, it's more likely to be VT. If they don't, if they're really young and fit, it's more likely to be one of those aberrant rhythms. Um, and there are a couple of other things as well, but those are the main things that I can think of. Would we be expected to give adenosine as an F1? I have never given adenosine as an F1, no. 
absolutely not. Um, they, I mean, I've done the Valsalva and I have cardioverted someone, but that's been with a consultant literally right behind me. Um, and they had a vasovagal after the Valsalva, so I was really glad the senior was there. I think you'd be expected to um, do the initial investigations, like prep the things that are needed. Um, but yeah, um, I, I've never given adenosine as an F1. Um, and again, it's really useful to have listened to the chest and say like, oh, this patient's wheezy, I don't think we should give adenosine, et cetera. But you I mean your main job is information gathering and initial stabilization. So these are my main chest pain differentials that I try to exclude with every patient. First one is sort of ACS, so um, either that classic chest pain um, or it can be sort of shortness of breath, non-specific things in patients at risk of silent MIs, um, so like if they're female, older, immune compromised and diabetic. Um, so tropes and ECGs for every patient with chest pain um, without exception. Um, dissection is another one uh, that I've been unfortunate enough to see on call. I don't know why I'm such a bad luck magnet. Um, the main thing I would tell you is about chest pain plus neuro signs. Um, if the dissection involves like the carotids or the vertebral arteries, they can get these really weird neuro signs along with this crushing chest pain. Um, BP difference in arms is one of those things where if it's there, it's useful. And if it's not there, it's not very useful to exclude. Um, so equal BPs, equal pulses doesn't mean no dissection. Um, look for documentation of a known AAA, do a full neuro exam in chest pain patients, ask about tearing pain. So sometimes they won't describe pain that travels from front to back. Sometimes they'll describe it going like up and down their chest. And that, again, is quite concerning for dissection. Um, Grant, pneumothorax, again, like pleuritic chest pain, reduced air entry on one side. So make sure to also it right down to the bases. Um, and I'll get a chest x-ray in, in most chest pain patients unless I can really definitively say it's not a pneumothorax. Um, but again, I think in those early stages of F1, it would be pretty bold to say that it's definitely not something without um, investigating it. I always tend to over-investigate chest pain. Um, again, PE, hypoxia with a normal chest x-ray, as we talked about, and that pleuritic pain as well. Um, the PERC scoring system is really good. It's the pulmonary embolism rule out criteria. Um, and it basically asks you a lot of things about whether they're taking hormones, whether they've had hemoptysis, some stuff about their OBS in their background. And if they've got a PERC score of zero, there is something like 2% chance of having a PE. Um, Wells is pretty useful, plus a D-dimer. And obviously ask the patient to cough and deep breathe to try and reproduce or elicit that pain. And then again, tamponade um, seems like a rogue one. Again, this is something I've seen uh, twice on night shifts um so <laughs> the, um, they've had a raised jbp they have had like two to three of, of bex triad um neither of them had recent cardiac surgery or chest wall trauma um but again if like none of your other um differentials really fit the picture it might be worth considering a tamponade um but you know again that, that's probably gonna be something that needs to see in your input um, so just thought I'd summarise um, a few key points and then I can see a couple questions in the chat box, so I'll go to them as well. Um, chest pain workup, obviously we've chatted through all of this in a few minutes um, and you've had your tropes right there and your x-ray and your ECG. Um, don't like stress if it happens much more slowly in real life and like someone has to be sent to another ward to get the ECG machine and all of this. Um, unless patients are really unwell, you do have a little bit of time just to sort of work them up and obviously they, they have to wait like two hours and then six hours for the repeat tropes and things um so don't be concerned if you don't have all that information at once and you're kind of panicking about a chest pain as long as you're systematic about it you'll be okay good to have a standard workup i just do um a few bloods um repeat tropes ecgs an x-ray um and an ate and you can consider these other things as well amylase for pancreatitis or lfts for cholecystitis and then a d-dimer for pe or dissection um, but I would warn you against starting a D-dimer in post-op patients or patients with active infection. Um, I speak from experience, it's not going to be very helpful. Um, if, they're if they have chest pain and they're using, again, that's sort of a bit alarm bells isn't it? Um, and I would maybe call a senior. Um, at, at least until you start to develop that sense of, I'm worried about this patient, I'm not worried about this patient. Um, and then be wary of being misled away from differentials by these like things that people tell you. So we talked about like the pulses being equal in both arms. And I heard that like being discussed about a lot in the first few months of um, FY. But actually, it doesn't mean no dissection. It's got a really poor predictive value. Um, and it, it, if you sort of feel that the pulses are symmetrical, but you still worry about a dissection, I would investigate them for a dissection. Same thing with chest wall tenderness and um, being costochondritis, because chest wall pain is something that's been documented in MI patients as well. So still investigate these patients fully. 
Um, right, so before we move on to the next bleep, I'm just going to quickly check the chat box. Um, in an unstable patient requiring cardioversion, do they still need to be sedated? Yeah, cardioversion is really painful. And that's one of the reasons why you'll want a senior with you um, for SVT, because if um, obviously vehicle maneuvers and things don't work, then they're going to need to do their like lemon score, mal and patty. They're going to need to sedate them. Often it's with like propofol um, or really strong like fentanyl and things, IV. Um, they need hooked up to monitoring for that. There are certain criteria for like the number of staff and the seniority of staff that need to be present when you're sedating someone. Um, how much time should lapse between repeat troponins? Depends when the chest pain started. So if the chest pain started over 12 hours ago, in my hospital, one troponin is enough. Um, like one negative troponin, less than three is enough to exclude um, a cardiac cause. Um, all patients um, that I've seen get a zero R and a two R, plus or minus a six R if there's sort of like a bit of an unequivocal rise or I'm still a bit concerned about them clinically. Um, but that just depends. And I think, again, in our hospital guidelines, um, a significant rise is something like 30 percent from the first to the second. But again, I'd always just like just type the word troponin into your internet and you should find um, guidance for, for the hospital that you're working at. All right, um, so bleed four then. Um, this is someone asking you, can you come and review my patient in bed six? Her oxygen saturations have dipped to 83%. Um, so again, what do you guys want to know? I'm going to assume everyone is like really bored with this slide, but I find it quite useful. Um, so yeah, ask an order of a kitty. Um, Again, are they consciously concerned? What are the symptoms? What are the robs and what's their background? Um, so this is what the nurse tells you. Um, she's conscious, but I'm really worried about her. She's sat up breathing quickly. She sounds wheezy. Um, yikes. Um, it's probably time to go see the patient on the basis of that, isn't it? Um, so you get to the bedside and this is just kind of a, a quick summaries um summary of what you see does anyone have any um concerns any diagnoses that they're particularly keen to rule out yeah lovely you guys are very sharp i love it yeah absolutely anaphylaxis you've got um urticaria there you've got a potential precipitant in the form of the piperacil and tazobactam um, it's an itchy rash, she's wheezing, and she's only just recently had her um, antibiotics changed, hasn't she? Um, good. So, anaphylaxis. Um, I've put in um, uh, just a slide about the Resource Council's guidelines for anaphylaxis and then kind of just summarised a little F1 bit. So, um, anaphylaxis, I would put out a, a resource call. So, in my hospital, that's 2222. Depending on where you are, that might be different. Um, obviously, lie the bed flat with the legs raised. Um, this is something that I've learned recently as well. Not all hospitals have adrenaline pre-made. So um, and adrenaline is obviously one of those very few doses that you don't have time to look up in the BNF, really. So it's good to commit it to memory. Um, so it's 500 micrograms IM um, and uh, that goes into the anterolateral thigh. In some sims, uh, some scenarios that colleagues have told me about, they've had to give the adrenaline themselves. Um, in some scenarios, they haven't. Um, once the adrenaline is given, you start the timer um, and prep the second dose. Um, if they have no response after five minutes, they're going to need to get a second um, adrenaline. So you want to get that ready and then give them um, a bolus of IV fluids as well. I think the guideline used to mention things about hydrocortisone and chlorphenamine and things, but I don't think that's um, indicated anymore. And again, by that point, if you've put out a double two, double two, you, like help should be there and things. And obviously stop the precipitant as well. So if that Piptaz is still running, then just like disconnect it totally. Um, might be worth like also removing the bionector from the cannula just in case there's any in that as well. Um, pretty self-explanatory. Um, yeah, penicillin allergy, secure airway. Yeah. Um, how many times can you repeat the dose? So uh, the resus council only mentions two doses. Um, certainly if you've put out a resus call, um, you would expect someone to be there within five minutes anyway. So you alone won't have to think beyond two adrenaline doses because that will buy you enough time for people to be there. Um, as an F1, can you give adrenaline without supervision? Um, it's not something that I've done. 
it has been something that in sim sessions and things it's been emulated um but again if you've um put out a double two double two for anaphylaxis people will probably get there while you're prepping it and things anyway um at what point will you call a senior at your sho for anaphylaxis like right away um it's an airway emergency so it's it's um yeah i, I would put out a double two double two that'll get the whole crash team there including a reg um, and an sho um, so bleep five. Hi, doctor. Mr. Smith here was saturating at 88 early, um, earlier. Don't worry, I put him on three liters and he's at 100 percent. But would you mind just reviewing him? Um, so, again, what do you want to know? Um, again, I think have I changed the slide for this scenario? No, I haven't. Same same kind of format. Um, and this is what you're told by the staff. Um, so he's awake, yeah, he's a bit sleepy, um, but he's only just come up from A&E. Um, he came in with some shortness of breath. He was coughing up a bit of green stuff. They started him on some antibiotics in A&E, but he hasn't been clerked in or started on any other treatment yet. These are his other obs. So his heart rate's 98. BP looks okay, doesn't it? SPO2 was previously 88 on room air, and he's now saturating 100 on three liters via nasal cannula. Um, and his respirator is about 18 at the moment. Uh, he's a 70 year old gentleman admitted with an infective exacerbation of COPD. Um, so what's your sort of impression or what other things are you going to look into? COPD status. Interesting. Would you mind elaborating? What are the OBS after giving O2? So the only thing that changed after giving O2, sorry, was the um, saturations. He saturated from 88 to 100. Yeah, I, yeah, exactly whether or not they're a retainer yet. Yeah. So like previous ABGs, history of CO2 retention. So um, any ABGs on the system, are they a known CO2 retainer? Um, have any target sats been prescribed by the seniors? So when they were seen in A&E, when they were accepted by the referring medical officer and things, did anyone um, put any target sats you should be aiming for? Um, and then also the bit about them being sleepy is a little bit worrying. Obviously, this is meant to emulate a night shift, but you would want to rule out whether or not they're becoming hypercapnic. This is an ABG from their last admission. Uh, so this was just before their discharge. And um, do you guys have any thoughts based on that? Yeah, so it looks like they're a CO2 retainer, don't they? Just from um, that HCO3, uh, that's the most useful, um, most useful thing there. Uh, so yeah, they are a CO2 retainer. So for a COPD exacerbation, for A, what kind of things would you want to look for? Do you think any interventions needed at this point? Is there anything I've maybe touched on earlier that can affect airway patency or airway safety? I don't know if that was maybe a leading question. Um, so for A, if he's a bit sleepy, um, you want to know what his GCS is really. There's this um, like rhyme that goes like lower than eight, intubate. Um, obviously that wouldn't be you. Um, but if their airway is low enough, then you might want to escalate to a senior if you're concerned that they're not able to protect their own airway. So um, you go, Mr. X is a GCS 15. Um, he's orientated to place and time. He's sleeping, but he sort of wakes up when you go in the room, wakes up when, you know, the nurses are sort of adjusting his, um, you know, bring in the ops machine and things. So you're not concerned about his airway at the moment. B then is the main thing. Uh, do you guys have any thoughts on how you would manage or assess B at the moment? Yeah, so subutamol epitropium sounds good. Consider nebulized. Yeah, Venturi, that's a good idea. O2, yeah, O2 adjustment. ABG. Lovely. Ideal. So yeah, you want an ABG, don't you? Um, and if they've not had one in A&E, you might want to consider a chest x-ray as well. Um, so the Oxford Medical Guidelines for Oxygen and COPD suggest that if they're critically unwell, 
just give them OTA because um, hypoxia is going to kill them faster than their hypercapnia will. Um, Mr. X doesn't really fit that bracket, though, does he? His pulse rate's fine. He's afebrile. He's coughing up a bit of green stuff, um, but he's hemodynamically stable. Um, so we can aim for 88 to 92 in him. And actually, it looks as though he was saturating within his target sats before the oxygen was, was applied, um, wasn't it? Um, again, we've reviewed his past ABGs, haven't we? And we've decided that he is a chronic retainer. Yep, nebulized salbutamol. Um, if you give them one and they're sort of minimal improvement, then you can give some epitropium. Um, some hospitals have combi nebs with both. Um, mine doesn't, so you have to just sort of give them um, alternating. Um, if they're a suspected retainer and within the target sats, make sure they're being given air driven. Um, so with some of the nebulizers, they connect a little tube when you hook them up to the oxygen and then you turn the oxygen up and that drives the nebs. Um, and then you get these little machines that just drive it with the pressure of the air and they don't deliver any more oxygen than room air. So make sure that the nebulizers are being given one of those. Um, prednisolone as well, like a five day course. It can affect wound healing, um, and so with post-op, like patients, maybe if they've got a few other risk factors for poor wound healing, smokers, um, diabetics and things, maybe just run it by like an SHO. Um, but obviously, if they're if they're quite unwell and they need the prednisolone, alone, then that's fine. Yeah, um, I think the dose is 30 to 40. So I've tended to give like 30 for post-op patients um, and 40 for others. But again, it just depends on what your hospital recommends. Um, antibiotics and in COPD exacerbations are um, indicated if they have had a change in their sputum, if they've previously required um, admission for their exacerbations, if they've had any positive sputum cultures, and you'd want to send off a sputum culture on this admission as well. Uh, does all of that make sense? Any questions? How do you decide between IV hydrocortisone or oral pred? What's more commonly used? Um, I've used oral pred simply because it takes less time to prepare and the COPD exacerbations that I've seen haven't been in patients with like a swallow risk and they've been able to, to take their prednisolone. Um, I'm unsure when exactly you would use IV hydrocortisone apart from clear instances where like oral meds are contraindicated in general. Um, but like the guideline in our hospital doesn't really differentiate. It says oral pred's fine and that's been the handiest to give and the quickest to administer. So I've just given them that. Um, but again, obviously just defer to your hospital guidelines. Um, how do you just as O2 supply to aim for target sats? So with this patient, he was at target sats without any oxygen, just with room air. So I would take him off the oxygen. If he does need any oxygen, um, I'd be more tempted to deliver it um, via Venturi so that you know exactly how much he's getting. But it sounds like Mr. X doesn't really need any oxygen at the moment based on his previous stats on room air. Um, OK, so for C then, um, obviously his BP was all right, wasn't it? And his heart rate. Um, do you guys think any actions required on that front? Still doing ECG, yeah, yeah. Good idea for any sort of unwell patient, isn't it? I haven't actually put an ECG there. Apologies, guys. Um, but yeah, absolutely. Um, so, sorry, you can't really see my slides there. It's gone a little bit skew. If um, BP's okay, um, their heart rate might go up after a nebulizer, but I would just keep an eye on their fluid status. And if that's still okay, then then that's fine. Um, and then obviously an ECG um, and anyone would be a really good idea. So sorry for admitting that. Um, for D then, use a GCS-15. That might just need um, frequent monitoring, especially if they're at risk of hypercapnia and drowsiness associated with that. Um, and then because he's on steroids, he's going to need BM monitoring as well. Um, just because, especially if he's diabetic, but otherwise as well, because um, it puts you at risk of, of high BMs. Um, and then the sides cut off um, E, apologies, but again, nothing really exciting. The main pathology was in, in B there, wasn't it? So um, general workup, um, I've put bedside, bloods and um, boxygen, just for like a couple of useful bits that I've picked up. Um, so with hypoxic patients at the bedside, um, if they're hypoxic, and I think I've mentioned this earlier, it's worth getting a second OBS machine, like a second probe, switching from a finger probe to an ear probe and vice versa. So just to make sure that you're getting like a true reading, watching out for like nail. If someone's got nail polish on, look for like the nail with the least polish and put it on that. Try whatever and then, then obviously go off the best reading that you can get. Um, and posture adjustment is really important in SATs as well. 
Um, I haven't put it in, but actually the number of patients I've seen where they're sort of a little bit slumped sort of down in their bed and they're saturating not great, but then actually when you push them up, straighten them up, a couple of pillows behind their back, they're back up to target sets. Um, so make sure you're sort of optimising um, them um, and their environment so they can sort of get in as much oxygen as they can and make sure you're getting an accurate reading. Um, obviously, when you're assessing someone who's hypoxic, look for both signs of hypoxia and then signs of hypercapnia as well. Um, just because that obviously changes your management in terms of oxygen delivery, whether or not you might need to escalate to NIV. For bloods then, um, I thought this was quite useful. Um, so obviously you ABG any hypoxic patient, pretty intuitive. And then even if a COPD patient is admitted for um, a non-COPD slash non-hypoxia related cause, you might want to get a baseline for them anyway um, for a number of reasons. So if someone's brought in by ambulance, um, you can't adjust how much oxygen someone's getting as easily in an ambulance. So it might be that they're getting quite a high quantity of oxygen and transfer to the hospital. Um, and you also need a baseline in case they do become hypoxic and you need to decide what target sats they should remain within. You then re-ABG if anything changes. So any change in um, the oxygen that they require or the type of oxygen they require, if you need to change them up to your venturi from nasal cannula, etc., or if there's a change in their SATs or in their symptoms as well. And then for oxygen, obviously we've, we've had a chat about it already. Um, oxygen to any critically unwell patient, but if they're not critically unwell, you can be a bit pragmatic and you can think a little bit more about what oxygen delivery is going to be best for that patient. Just going to quickly check the um, chat box for any um, questions. Um, can you use ADPU over GCS? You can. Um, I, I mean, sometimes it can be tricky to assess GCS, um, but I like it because it's more sensitive to changes. Um, like you can, obviously, if someone is sort of um, like a V in the AVPU scale, they could be like a GCS 12 to 11 to 13, and it doesn't really tell you much. And if someone drops from a GCS 13 to 11, but they remain within that V category, you might sort of miss that subtle um, drop in GCS that's indicating that you might need to readdress that or do something about it. Um, how do you risk assess an ACS patient who develops a ventricular aneurysm? Excellent question. Um, I'm, I'm going to pass on that one, I'm afraid. Um, assess the risks of, of what exactly? Um, and while you're typing out, we'll just move on to the next slide. Um, yeah, so I just thought I'd put on some FY1 resources as well. MD Calc, I've mentioned it in the, um, in the PowerPoint. I think it's really useful. I use it all the time. The most useful thing is that they've got like a little Snellen chart. Um, I use it to test like visual acuity in patients with um, headaches and anyone I'm doing a cranial nerve exam in, um, patients with like facial fractures to check that there's no like orbital involvement, etc. They've always got well scores there. They've got MAP um, and they've got creatinine clearance for prescribings. All that's super useful. Um, BMJ best practice is expensive, um, but I've bought it and I use it every single day. They've got loads of like really useful pages for just like rogue bleeps. So, um, some hospitals use like an eye bleep system where you can just type on a little bleep and then it'll send it to the doctor. And sometimes it'll just be like, has vomited, please review, or has loose stools. And if you literally just type in vomiting, diarrhea, into BMJ best practice, it gives you urgent considerations that you need to rule out other differentials, investigations, and then management. Um, and it's all based off of like the nice CKS guidelines and they update it really regularly. I absolutely love it. Um, if your hospital uses iBleep, which a lot in the Northwest of England do, you can get this app on your phone um, and you can like check your bleeps as you walk between wards um, or as you're on your breaks and things just to see if any code reds or anything come up, it's really useful. And induction, again, is great. It's really useful for like internal phone numbers so you don't have to go through switchboard every time. Um, and they're quite frequently updated, or at least in my hospital as well. Um, guys, thank you so much for your time. I know that um, it's not the most in like interesting or exciting way to spend your Monday evening. I really hope it's been useful. Um, I'm more than happy for any of you to email me um, with queries and things. Most of this talk has been based off of the BMJ Best Practice app. Um, uh, the website even and then I got that oxygen bit on um, the Oxford Medical Education website as well. The ECGs are from Life in the Fast Lane and the chest x-rays are from Radiopedia. Um, so yeah any questions at all um, I'm more than happy to hang about and answer them although I'm aware I've taken up um, more than more than my fair share of your time.
a quick plug as well, but I am doing a Common Bleeps Part 2 talk on Wednesday evening. Um, we're going to cover, what are we going to cover? Falls. Um, we're going to cover confusion and we are going to cover temperature specs as well. Um, our slides are recordings available anywhere. I think the Mind the Bleep website um, take them. I don't know, Hamza, if you'd know more about that. Uh, yeah, so it will be available to watch on the Mind the Bleep YouTube channel as well. Um, so keep your eyes out for that. Thank you, Eva, for this uh, very interesting talk. And be sure to join her presentation on Wednesday. Yeah, I think that's all the questions we have at the moment. Uh, guys, be sure to fill out the feedback form as well. They'll be very helpful for us. Thanks right, so much for your time. Thank Thanks all. Bye.